What's good, YouTube? It's Mirror Square back in another video. So we're doing another lecture series, and today we're going to be talking all about rogue decks. So, you know, decks that are not necessarily tier one, but can still compete in the competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! atmosphere. How you can build a rogue deck, how you can take a rogue deck to an event and still do well. Again, guys, if you're interested in these slides, they are available in my Patreon, which will be linked in the description below. So definitely check that out. Other than that, let's just dive right in. So I've prepared a bunch of slides for you guys. And starting off at the top, talking about a rogue deck. What exactly is a rogue deck? You guys might have heard this term being slung around the Yu-Gi-Oh! community. Basically, a rogue deck is a deck that's uncommon in the metagame. Now, a common misconception is that people think rogue decks are decks that are not necessarily um, as good as the best decks. Which is true to an extent. You know, oftentimes these decks are a lot inferior to the actual tier one or even tier zero decks in terms of power, but sometimes they can also be decks that people have just not discovered at all, and they just happen to turn the entire metagame upside down because these rogue decks can just rival the current best deck and do well enough to go really deep in a competitive event, sometimes even winning an event. For example, we had Prank Kids, which was played by Dinkabui in YCS Milan 2018. So no one really knew that Prank Kids were any good, but he was able to take that and beat decks like Thunder Dragon, Orcus, Sky Striker, you know, all these other broken decks, but somehow he took a rogue deck and was able to go head to head against the rest of the meta decks. And then afterwards, people started realizing that Prankids are pretty good and started playing them more and more. And of course, there are other incidents throughout history. Uh, one that I can remember from 14 years ago was when Fraser Smith actually won YC Atlanta in 2010 with Gravekeepers. So this was like a very, very early format. I think just post Edison or maybe pre Edison, I think, where plant synchros were very, very popular. There are a lot of graveyard based decks. And he just took Gravekeepers out of the blue with Pot of Duality and just won the entire event. I think in the finals, he actually played his teammate Sean Maccabi and there was actually a identical mirror match, Gravekeeper versus Gravekeeper. Of course, cards like Royal Tribute just destroyed the entire metagame. And then on top of that, you had Necro Valley to kind of secure your win. So there have been a lot of cases where rogue decks have come out of nowhere to kind of tear up the metagame, and they're not necessarily always decks that are not as good as the top decks. Sometimes they are good, as good as the top decks, or even better. But it just really is a definition of saying a deck that's uncommon, that has not yet been seen in the metagame. Moving on, okay. Um, benefits of playing rogue. Well, obviously you catch your opponent off guard, as they might not be super familiar with your lines of play, with your combos, with your strategy, which means they're probably not going to interact at the correct choke points. So a lot of people might not realize when to use their hand traps, for example, when to use their Omni Negates. And that allows you to have a lot more wiggle room because if they're using it on the wrong card, a lot of times that trades very favorably for you because you're able to play through things if they're negating cards that you can replace with other cards, right? So um, that's just one thing to keep note of. Also, a rogue deck should ideally, I think, have some sort of an edge. And by the an edge, I mean, having something that allows them to distinguish themselves on top of the current best decks and actually be able to uh, leverage that edge to get an advantage over the other decks in the metagame. And the edge can be either like a physical playable secret tech card, or it could be like something strategic. So a playable card might be like Dimensional Shifter. You know, back in the day, no one really played Dimension Shifter. And then suddenly people were like, oh, Dimension Shifter can be played in this deck. So we're going to start playing it. And that card was just like a huge blowout. And decks like Thunder Rees, obviously, it's a very, very auto win card. So that being something in terms of a playable card example. Where strategic is like when you play a rogue deck, you pick a rogue deck that might duck a lot of the popular main deck hand traps. For example, Flounder Reese kind of ducks cards like Nibiru, it ducks Skills Mourner because you normal summon everything and you're typically not summoning more than five times. Or even if you are, it doesn't really matter if they Nibiru, at that point you're probably pretty ahead. So these are two examples of the edge card, I would say. One is being the physical card that can, uh, other decks can't play that you can take advantage of, and the other being like a strategic thing where you fit very well, you play very favorably into the metagame, whether that's like dodging hand traps or just another way that your deck kind of interacts. You know, Gravekeepers, again, Necro Valley, just having the benefit of boosting their deck, as well as coincidentally shutting down the graveyard-based decks that were already in the metagame is just something else that I would consider strategic. But what about the weaknesses of playing Rogue? Obviously, these Rogue decks are, you know, there's gotta be some drawbacks. It's like, why would you not play the best deck? What are, uh, you know, the potential potential weaknesses of showing up with a deck that no one's ever seen. Well, your deck often is likely worse than the best decks. Yes, again, we talked about decks 
Rogue decks being just as good or better than best decks, but typically this is not the case. Like the players nowadays are very, very good at the game. And a lot of times they do discover, you know, other things that might be good. So like rogue decks might already been discovered and hyped by the time a competitive event already happens. Generally people are very, very good at that nowadays, especially because we have the OCG to kind of draw the statistics from and look at their decks and see how they're playing. So nowadays, a lot of the rogue decks are typically a lot worse than the actual best decks that are existing in the metagame. So when you compare them engine to engine, typically the best deck is gonna win a lot of the time, right? If you compare like a deck back in the day, like Sky Striker versus Outlitch, if you just played engine cards versus engine cards, Sky Striker is gonna win like almost 100% of the time. The reason that Eldritch was able to survive is because they played a lot of floodgate based cards that prevented the Sky Striker player from playing, right? So that's where this search point comes in. Rogue decks are typically forced to rely on a lot of powerful non engine cards like floodgates to level the playing field and then, you know, to half the time prevent your opponent from playing and then win with their engine. So them being able to take advantage of these non-engine cards that a lot of times directly counter what the metagame relevant decks are trying to do, uh, kind of pushes them ahead. Like Hashira, again, playing Shifter, so on and so forth. And oftentimes, you know, these rogue decks nowadays are built specifically to counter the best decks in the format because those best decks are very, very reliant on a certain line of play. For example, Snake Eyes still kind of reliant on summoning stuff from the graveyard or stuff hitting the grave, especially in the Fire King variant. And that also means that there's a key weakness, if you think about it, if you build a rogue deck to beat the existing best deck, a lot of times you're jamming in cards that are specifically good against that best deck, but these cards are not necessarily good against other rogue decks, so you might have an abysmal matchup against another rogue deck. For example, if you're playing, you know, Dimension Shifter, well, it's going to be useless against Flunderies or Kashira because they're already playing Shifter as well, so you kind of have Ricks, right? And if you compare even like your engine to another rogue deck engine, sometimes you just get beat. Um, I think a couple formats ago, you know, Branded was more of a roguish deck because it wasn't really popular in the metagame. And if you played another deck like Chimera, a lot of times you were just losing because their Branded engine was just so much more oppressive than yours. They were able to recycle a lot more things and the engine just worked a lot better than some of the other decks. So that's just something to uh, note there as well. There are definitely some drawbacks of playing rogue. So you have absolutely have to be sure that you're ready to go into the uh, event and you're fully prepared you test the heck out of the rogue deck and you know it can actually fare well against the best deck but also against other rogue decks that might be uh, flying around in the metagame when do you play rogue well when you discover a strategy that you can basically compete against the top deck of course you have to go at least toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best deck or the best decks in the format but also the deck should be under the radar and has like a surprise factor that allows you to get some sort of an edge, right? So obviously your opponent not knowing what your cards do, having to read your cards, having to kind of uh, gauge when they want to respond to your cards. All this stuff is really, really important and that contributes to your edge. Again, the strategic edge of you knowing how your opponent's deck works, but they don't necessarily know how your cards work or your deck works. Also, again, we talked about a strategy dodging popular non engine cards in the metagame. So, again, dodging popular hand traps like Nibiru, maybe Ghost Mourner, but also dodging certain board breakers as well that people are main decking as well. So, sometimes that can come up. Uh, there's certain decks, certain formats people are main decking like Evenly Matched or cards like Dark Ruler. Maybe you have a deck that doesn't really care about those cards. So, that makes those cards just dead for your opponent. And obviously when your deck can take advantage of a very, very powerful card that no other deck can really take advantage of, might be another reason to propel you to play Rogue. For example, Dimension Shifter, you know, having these decks like Tier Limits that were just very, very graveyard centric, made it so this card suddenly became very, very powerful. And then people said, hey, you know what? We can actually start playing this card in the right deck because it shuts down their deck completely. So that definitely is another uh, sense of an edge. And uh, the last point is when to play Rogue. I think when a strategy can abuse newly released cards and in testing, you discover these cards to be extremely powerful and you feel like no one else has made that conclusion as well. So um, the player base might be focusing on new decks that are coming out. For example, we have new decks like Tenpai coming out. Uh, we have a couple of new decks in the Legend of uh, Destruction, Legacy of Destruction or whatever the next set is. We have some cards like Infernoids and also the uh, Ice Barrier stuff coming out in the summer in the Brothers of Legend. So people are kind of focusing on these decks that are already good and established in the OCG and people are hyping up, but there might be other strategies in those sets that you guys discover. Maybe it's a support card for an existing strategy or maybe it's just a new strategy altogether. And you might 
might in testing realize, hey, these cards are really, really good. I don't think anyone else is kind of focusing on them. So I'm gonna try and kind of make this really, really powerful. I play test it against the best decks and I can beat and go head to head with the best decks. I can beat them. Then that might be another reason that you actually bring it because it kind of like fulfills all the three points that we talked about. You know, it is a strategy that no one's really gonna know how to play against. It might uh, have advantage against um, certain decks by playing a powerful card. And of course, no one really knows that this card is on the map and you kind of establish that. So that's another reason I think you could definitely play Rogue. How to build a Rogue deck? Well, you have to consider the weaknesses of the best deck, right? Like what are their pain points? What are we trying to shut off here that the best decks rely on to play? So uh, in tier zero formats like tier elements, obviously Rogue players had to build specifically to cut off the graveyard period because they were very, very graveyard reliant being able to mill multiple cards. So a lot of decks were either playing shifter or main decking a huge bestial count. I think we remember sprite decks just main decking like eight base deals just to try and compete. Also D shifter. Um, people just realized if you're playing a road deck in tier zero format like tier elements, you just had to cut off the graveyard. So we had to attack that weak point by addressing uh, these uh, powerful cards like shifter and you know uh, base deals to kind of address the issue. But also your rogue deck should benefit from the engine if it's possible. So uh, I know prank kids, they didn't really care about adding cards from the deck to the hand as much. So they weren't really affected by Colossus. Um, there are uh, engine cards like Flundery's Empen that locks down extra deck monster effects. So that might be relevant in the right format as well. So if your rogue deck kind of can benefit from the engine, ideally that would be something that's a bit of a plus as well. In addition to having good non-engine cards that actually hurt the format and then dodging, you know, all the popular cards in the format. And then of course, we talked about this previously, but like playing rogue versus rogue, you're not always gonna be playing the meta decks. In a popular tournament, even like tier zero formats, there will always be people that are playing rogue decks and experimenting, whether it's a budget issue or they just dis decided to not play the meta game, they were kind of bored of it, or they thought they had a viable strategy that actually counteracted it, just like you do if you bring your rogue deck to the tournament, of course. So you will be playing other rogue deck, especially earlier on in the matches when people have not really lost to the best decks yet. So just expect that. Uh, does your deck have the flexibility in the side deck to side out cards in your main deck that are dead in those rogue versus rogue matchups, right? Again, we talked about Kastira, Mirror Match, or against Flunderies. You have shifters. Those should just go out. Maybe cards like Nibiru are also dead. You have to take those out. So do you have enough cards in your side deck to bring in that actually allow you to uh, take out those dead cards, right? And a lot of times it might be that you do not have enough cards to put in to take out, which is completely fine. If you have like three cards that are completely dead, sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and accept that you will have some bricks in those matchups. But if you're building a rogue deck to win, you're probably just accounting for more meta decks in the top cut. So you have to just um, slave along the way through those Swiss rounds and kind of grind through that while playing the bricks. Sometimes that's just an inevitable thing that you have to do, but just um, know that you have to uh, kind of account for that. And then of course, it comes to engine to engine. Is your engine powerful enough to actually carry the deck without relying on your non-engine? Because again, if you're playing another rogue deck and their engine is just way better than yours, it's going to be a real struggle, especially if you have certain cards that are dead in the matchup. So make sure that you do kind of account for being able to side deck cards that can replace these cards that might be bad against other rogue decks. And also your engine should be generally quite decent that you can still win. Here's some popular rogue decks throughout history, so you guys can check this out. Again, we have the links. Everything's hyperlinked in the slide. If you're in the Patreon subscriber of any tier level, you can get access to this. These are links to deck profiles and things along the way. So we had a bunch of different um, rogue decks that happened across the period of time. You know, Gladiator Beast during the Tier 0 Teledad format. We had TG Stun in 2012 when it won in a wind-up Dino Rabbit in Zector format. Shout out to Marquise Henderson, who actually came out of nowhere with that deck. Um, there was an X Saber deck that went 7 1 in YCS Miami after X Sabers were like basically wiped out of the metagame, and he had no side deck. We don't know how the heck that happened. Uh, it was weird, but uh, apparently he did that. Top uh, 64 in the NAWCQ 2013, Madolce, actually in a tier 0 Dragon Ruler spellbook format. There were so many different cool decks that you guys can definitely check out. So definitely give that a look through. And if you guys have seen any other rogue decks that have done well throughout history, definitely let us know in the comments below because I do not have nearly as close to everything that uh, should be in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! in terms of rogue decks. And that's about it at the end. So if you guys enjoyed this, definitely uh, hit that like, subscribe button, leave a comment below. Again, really quickly, you can check out the Squiddy store. We have some merch available, some t-shirts on the site. We have a Patreon that we previously just discussed so you guys can sign up. Again, any tier level gets you access to these slides as well as some other exclusive content. So take a look through that. And you can contact me, of course, through Discord, through the Metafy, through you Twitter, or leaving a comment. Guys, thanks a lot for tuning in. If you guys want to see more of this, let me know in the comments below, and I'll continue to make more, because I think these are kind of fun, and they're very, very good for an educational standpoint when it comes to competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! Other than that, I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Bye-bye.